401. Thank you, Melinda, for the reminder. Uh, let me call the meeting to order of the Denver Regional Council of Governments Board work session for Wednesday, April 7, 2021. My name is Kevin Flynn. I'm the vice chair of the board and I, and I uh, chair the meetings of the, uh, the work sessions. So let's, uh, now that I've called it to order, let me uh, ask uh, Melinda, who uh, is our uh, managing this meeting. Uh, we have public comment available uh, at each meeting. And uh, today we ask that there be no public comment on issues for which a prior public hearing has been held before the board uh, in, in the past. And so Melinda, do we have anybody raising their hand in the uh, attendees list who might want to offer uh, three minutes of uh, public comment to the board? If anybody is in the, in the participant list, in the attendees list, raise your hand, please, if you would like to offer comment. Okay, and then uh, I will also add that if there is anyone on the phone for public comment, uh, you'll just need to hit star nine to raise a virtual hand, and then we can call on you and we'll unmute you, and then you'll just need to hit star six to unmute yourself. Great, I'll give it about 10 seconds. Thank you. I don't see anybody raising their hand. Uh, Melinda, do you? I don't know if you have a different view on your end. Uh, no, okay? I'm, I'm right there with you. I don't see anyone either. Okay, thank you. Uh, so we will uh, move on to item three, which is the summary of the March 3rd board work session. I've looked through it. I, if other members have had a chance to look through it and review it, does anybody have any uh, uh, comments or changes or amendments to make to it? Raise your hand. I don't see any. So with that, uh, I will consider- it looks, the, like, it looks like John Peck has her hand up. I don't. Oh, okay, thank you. I don't, there it is. Joan, yes. Thank you, I just uh, I just found the little hand icon in time, I guess. So I have a couple of things that, um, as I read through it, both uh, the amended part as well as the original, there are some things that I, I think we should have on our radar. Okay. Um, and um, I don't know if there are amendments now, but my, my ask is as we monitor these two things, can we amend this uh, Metro Vision Plan? And the first one is um, working to reduce the methane in the oil and gas. Um, I'm sure you're aware of the fact that the CDPHE has three whistleblower complaints and an investigation is, uh, is going into, is being done to see if those whistleblower complaints have any validity. My concern is, and there are a couple of things in Longmont that we had gotten from CDPHE. Hey, but Joan, can I ask you, are, are, yeah. these amendments, are these amendments or changes that you're offering to the meeting summary from last month? Uh, yeah, well, okay. I, I don't know. I guess what I wanna know is, are these worth uh, putting in the amendment summary? Um, because if we're getting that information from CDPHE, are we, um, are we monitoring this so that we can change the uh, what we're doing with oil and gas and CDPHE? Hey, Doug, um, do you want to, Doug, do you want to comment on that? Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, Director Peck, I'm just trying to understand exactly where you're thinking we should include this information in the in the, in the meeting summary from last time. Uh, perhaps, yes. Um, because my concern is uh, if we are working to reduce methane from oil and gas and we are getting wrong information from CDPHE, are we actually going to be able to meet our objectives? So it, should there be a statement about monitoring this so that we can amend our, our uh, progress or where we wanna go or how, how we're working with, with CDPHE? I just want to make sure that we're all on the right path and going to accomplish the goals we want. Um, but if we're getting wrong information, we won't be able to do that. Right, so, right. Um, yeah. I, don't, I don't know what this means. Is it an amendment? Is it just something to monitor? Um, I just want to put it on the radar. Uh, yeah, okay. Mr. Say? Chairman and Director Peck, I, I would suggest that maybe we monitor it right now. Um, with regards, because you know it wasn't an issue that was specifically brought up in the last meeting, so I, I don't know if the meeting summary is the appropriate place to to okay. include okay. that. But we can, you know, we can have further conversations about it for sure. 
Okay. That's come up since then, correct? Yes, yeah. definitely. Okay. My okay. other so, one was uh, yeah. the transportation planning and investment. Um, we have the Northwest Corridor as uh, an objective in 2050, but the governor has said he wanted it completed by 2026. Um, and this definitely, um, definitely affects su uh, the supporting objectives of a vibrant regional uh, economy. So um, do we want to monitor this as well? And can we amend the Metro Vision plan of the Northwest Corridor by 2050? Um, or if we accept this plan and these amendments, are, are we stuck with this? Or can we go back and amend it? Amend it? That's what I would like to know. Okay, Doug, can you give us direction on that? Yeah, and I know Ron Papsdorf is probably on the call too, but with regards to Metro Vision Regional Transportation Plan, um, yeah, we amend that plan fairly frequently Director Beck, if you, you recall, maybe maybe too frequently for some people, but we do offer opportunities to do that. Um, so if, if okay. things become more clear as we go further along the road, then we can we can definitely do so. Thank you. Sure. Thank you. Does anyone else have any uh, observations, changes, or recommendations for the uh, summary? Okay. I don't see any other hands now that I know where to look, and uh, we'll consider those accepted. Uh, I, uh, as chair, I want to rearrange the agenda here because I see Senator Winter is on the call now. And uh, we want to take item out of order, uh, item five, to uh, discuss a draft legislative proposal for state transportation funding. And Ron, uh, uh, you were going to uh, uh, lead this discussion. Is Ron in the meeting now? I, I am, Mr. Chair. Thank you. There you are. All right. Okay. Thank you. Do you want to introduce Senator Winter? Or uh, glad I see that Representative Gray and Senator Winter are both there um, oh. in Hollywood Squares. And there you are. Uh, I think my my sole role here with with them being at, in attendance is to turn it over to them to address the board regarding the um, transportation funding uh, concept. Okay. Thank you. Uh, uh, please proceed. Great, thank you. Um, and uh, hopefully Maria can share her screen. Perfect, we have some slides. But first I just wanna thank Dr. Cog for hosting and running and providing all the administrative support for the RTD Accountability Committee that we worked on last year. We really appreciate that. Uh, we just passed the bill out of the house and it's coming to the Senate on RTD. And so we know that Dr. Cog has put a lot of staff time and effort into that project. And so thank you, Dr. Cog, for doing that. Um, it's made a big difference and we really appreciate you being the home for the RTD Accountability Committee. Yes, and I would say thank you for that. We did just pass it out of the house today, I believe. Um, thank you so much for your support. And I think it's gonna really help the district uh, deliver on hopefully all the projects they have planned and some other things we'll talk about moving forward in this presentation for the future. Uh, and then we're excited today to talk about our transportation funding plan. This is a bill that will be coming forward soon that represent great mayor running along with Speaker Garnett and Majority Leader Fundberg. Next slide, please. And so what we want to talk about today is really about modernizing our transportation objectives, both how we're raising money into the transportation infrastructure, because how we're using our roads differs, but also how we're spending our money and preparing for the future and making sure that Colorado stays competitive. Next slide. All right, so why are we doing this? Um, what is this transportation proposal going to do? The first focus is to maintain our roads and highways by helping us implement our 10-year plan. And a lot of that is focused on a fix-it-first approach that's going to maintain safety and improve congestion in the most congested areas of the state. It's going to establish a needed sustainable funding source for transportation. And this is really important because we'll talk about how what we're doing now isn't sustainable and we want to set up future legislatures and future communities for success with sustainable funding. We're also gonna be increasing multimodal options 
to make sure that people have more choice on how they're getting around, getting to their jobs, getting to the doctors. And finally, this invest in charging infrastructure and the electrification of our vehicles to help Colorado meet our ambitious carbon reduction goals and our greenhouse gas reduction goals. And at the same time, we're doing this in a way that's going to save Coloradans money. Next slide. So we know the status quo is not a sustainable option. We have not been keeping up with our transportation infrastructure needs for a very long time. And this is the year to solve this and change the status quo. Next slide. All right. So if we don't do anything, consumers are going to pay more. We're paying $6.3 billion a year into a transportation system that isn't working for folks. People are sitting in traffic every single day. And when we sit in traffic, we're not spending time with our families. We're not spending time at work. And we're not spending time spending money on our economy. And right now, on average, people are spending $732 a year um, stuck in traffic and on repairs to their car because of our bad transportation system. Next slide. You all know, being local government officials, that our gas tax cannot pay for our roads. We have not increased our gas tax since 1991. Right now, it's only 22 cents. If it had kept up with inflation, it would be 44 cents, giving us double the purchasing power. So right now, we spend $624 million a year on transportation. If we would had just kept up with inflation, that would be $1.2 billion, which is pretty significant difference. And on top of that, the purchasing power of the gas tax just is changing rapidly. One, for really good reasons, because as we buy more hybrids, more electric vehicles, and our vehicles become more fuel efficient, we're just spending a lot less money on gas than we were in 1991, the last time we increased the gas tax. In addition, the cost of building roads, repairing roads, filling potholes has gone up significantly. So the cost of construction has gone up, the purchasing power of gasoline has gone down, and we didn't keep up with inflation. This clearly isn't working and we've fallen behind. Next slide. This is a map of other states that have solved this problem. And so we're coming to you today with a solution when other states have simply in Republican led or in a bipartisan way said, let's increase our gas tax and we're gonna make jobs and build good roads and everything's gonna be a little bit better. And we're talking about places like Alaska and Kentucky and Montana, Wyoming, Missouri. Uh, and what that means for us also is we're not staying competitive because when our transportation system isn't competitive, it's easier for people to fly to Utah and go skiing. It's easier for agricultural products to be transported in other states than it is our state. So if we want to be competitive for tourism and agriculture and quality of life, this is a problem that we have to solve. Next slide. All right, so here's our plan. We're very excited to present it to you, um, what we're gonna do. So first, we know everyone's hurting right now and we're in a pandemic, the economy's not great, we're building back better. So the first thing we can do is reduce our faster fees. But just temporarily, we're gonna reduce them for the next 10 years. And this is a reduction in the state's share. So I know a lot of you are local elected officials. We are holding local funding and transit funding harmless and, it's, um, and it rates will resume in 2024. Also, um, we will not be doing any of these fees until 2023, giving the economy and families time to recover. And then finally, this really helps us save money because right now we're spending a lot of money uh, repairing our cars because of the wear and tear that happens because of our bad roads. Next slide. All right, so how are we going to spend the money? We're going to raise basically $4 billion, very close to $4 billion. And 2.78 billion of that is gonna go through the HUTF that you are all very familiar with. So that's 18% um, to cities, 22% to counties, and the remaining to CDOT. We're gonna have 724 million of this new revenue 
as a down payment to our greenhouse gas reduction roadmap. So this is going to help us electrify. And this means electrification both within the uh, individual sector, also things like electric school buses, electric tra public transit buses, and making sure we have the infrastructure to convert our individual years, our heavy duty and our light duty to the electric vehicle needs that we need to meet our carbon reduction goals. We're also investing 366 million, which is a historic investment into multimodal mitigation option funds, which one helps us meet our carbon goals, but it's also about equity and giving people transportation choices on how they move around. And then this is very important for the Dr. Cog region because a lot of this money is gonna to go to the Dr. Cog region. And that's $106 million of new fee revenue is gonna be allocated to a newly created non-attainment fund um, area. So if you're in a non-attainment zone, which the entirety of Dr. Cog is for air quality, you will qualify for these funds to do projects that will help clear our air and support disproportionately impacted communities. Next slide. And now I'm gonna turn it over to Representative Gray to talk about how we're raising these funds. Um, and so Representative Gray. Thank you very much. We are looking to everyone who uses the system, who uses the transportation system. We're asking people for a little bit more um, to contribute into it because we know that where we are with the gas tax isn't working in the way that Senator Winter described. We know that the gas tax isn't uh, a sustainable source and it's the one we're leaning on the most. So what are we looking at doing? Well, first off, the state is first and foremost in, in contributing as well. We're looking at $1.23 billion um, over the next 10 years in contributing into the system because it, we want to, everybody to know if we're going to ask everyone else to contribute in more, we're going to do it ourselves as well. Um, this It comes in in a number of ways. It comes in in stimulus funds, it comes in in ongoing general fund contribution, it comes in in paying off the COPs that come out of the general fund that have been here for, excuse me, funding um, um, transportation as we've gone along. So um, there's a lot of different areas, but know that like as we ask other folks to contribute, we know the state needs to contribute as well and we're planning on it. Next slide, please. So this slide right here, you will get, um, I, I think you, you're, you probably already have, but you'll get a copy of it. You don't need to worry about it, like getting like a screenshot of it. We can send you this whole slide deck. Uh, but this is what we're looking at right now as we're going into drafting where we do have a bill draft but we don't have um, definitive numbers right now um, or a definitive draft right now but this is what we want you to look at and think about um, to talk about where we're going to get the money from a ton of it comes from um, new new sources based on how people use the road and so we want to, what we want to do is we want to move away from gas because, for example, um, I don't know how many of you use Facebook, but there's a lot of ads right now on Facebook for the new electric Hummer that's coming, um, which the Hummer, um, you know, has been set aside for a lot of people, but they're, it's coming back, um, but it's coming back as an electric vehicle. And so we need to not rely on gasoline the way that we have. Um, but gasoline is also a bridge in the short to medium term to get us to where we need to be. Um, and we're, so we're going to, we're going to rely on gasoline for a little while longer, but we're, we are also want fees that increase as gasoline decreases. And so that's the portfolio you see in front of you. Um, I don't want to say every single number that's on that slide. You can see it, but we can also answer any questions you have. Next slide. All right, so how are we spending this money? First, funding the CDOT 10-year plan, which many of you had input on and helped shape the 10-year plan for CDOT. Um, so it helps pay for the six unfunded years and creates thousands of jobs all over the state, which will help stimulate the economy. This also repairs 2,600 lane miles, which is really important. And we know in the Dr. Cog region, 
right? We are raising a lot of money that is going to fund infrastructure statewide. And this is really important because we rely on those roads for our constituents to be able to go recreate all over Colorado. But also we, we need our Palisade peaches and Rocky Ford cantaloupes. And for our economy to work, we need a statewide transportation structure. Um, this also develops and improves congestion in key areas that our constituents are sitting in traffic every single day. So areas like I-70 and Floyd Hill, 270, 76. And so we're looking at relieving congestion and getting people out of traffic, which we know our constituents are asking us to do all the time. And then this, in, this is a historic investment in multimodal uh, infrastructure, and it builds a series of multimodal hubs along I, the I-25 corridor, reduces VMT, and gives folks more choices on how they move about. Next slide. All right, so we do have this new $106 million, which is going to benefit significantly the Dr. Carl region. Um, and this is to fund mitigation projects within the next 10 years. Um, eligibility is gonna be competitive and limited to communities that are currently in non-attainment air zones which are the Dr. Cog region and Weldon Lammer. CEDA is gonna work with local communities to identify and prioritize the most high impact projects that help clear our air, clear our air and help disproportionately impacted communities. Next slide. And then we're gonna spend $366 million on the multimodal and mitigation option funds. Um, and the important part for you all is 40% of it's going to be spent at the state level, 60% is going to be spent for local governments. Um, and this can be for multimodal projects, and it's expanded to include greenhouse gas mitigation projects, because right now the number one carbon emitter in Colorado is the transportation sector. We're not going to meet our 1261 goals in our greenhouse gas reduction roadmap goals without having a significant impact in the transportation sector. So these are going to be money that is available for you that are selected and go through the MPOs and TPRs uh, like you in order to improve our air quality, increase multimodal options all over the state and especially in the Dr. Cog region. Next slide. Sure, and our goals um, are not just to expand transportation the way we've always thought about it. Our goals are also to expand transportation in ways that we expand equity and access to other people. So we want to make sure that we are supporting multimodal options, that we are uh, targeting underserved communities, and that we're addressing places where pollution is harder than ever before. You know, climate is a huge goal we need to address and we're going to. Uh, but we also need to recognize that when it comes to air quality, um, air quality has not been affected in the same way across the state in every community the way that it is everywhere else. And we want to address um, low to moderate income communities that are disproportionately impacted by um, air quality and air quality pollution. And so we want to actually address the those things in a way that's better than what we've done before. And that's an important part of the bill. Next slide. What we're really trying to do is strike the right balance. Um, and so something the majority leader coined was we are trying to be aggressively reasonable in everything we're proposing in the solution. So acknowledging that we have not had a sustainable funding source, we are falling behind. And we know that everyone that's watched this presentation has something that they really like in it and something that they don't love in it. And that's part of striking the right balance in terms of moving forward and getting something that we can pass and sets us up for success. So we are trying to meet the rural needs and challenges and respecting the vital role the rural community plays in our economy, ensure that rural Colorado is an essential part in connecting us together and addressing those unique safety needs while also recognizing the infrastructure, equity and health and climate that our constituents are facing on a daily basis because that's really where the congestion is. It's where the pollution is. We know our constituents in the urban areas want to get out of traffic. And so we believe that this plan uh, promotes 
all of those goals, we can address climate, we can address rural needs, and we can address urban needs and help people get out of traffic. Next slide. And then of course, we're not gonna be raising $4 billion without having accountability. That's just good governance and basic responsibility. And so we have a lot of accountability right now in terms of where money is going, what projects is being spent on. CDOT has been creating dashboards showing you exactly how much money is going into projects, the timeline of projects. We're gonna make sure that we have that accountability in all the enterprises we're creating around electrification, accountability in the multimodal options fund. We're gonna have transparency. We're gonna be updating folks on if we're meeting our climate goals. And so accountability and transparency is a really important part of this plan because if we're asking everyone to invest a little bit more, we as a state have to say, we are gonna be accountable to you and show you what you're getting for that investment. Next slide. And this is the final uh, sort of recap of everything we've said. I and mean, we'll, we'll get you a copy of these slides. We won't say all of it in here, but basically what we're trying to do is invest in uh, CDOT's 10 year plan. We're trying to build back better than we were before. And we're trying to uh, accomplish our economic, I'm um, sorry, our environmental goals all at the same time. And we think that we can do that. We think that we can invest in the community. We think we can build better mobility and we can achieve our climate goals all at the same time. And that's something that uh, myself and Senator Winter and Speaker Garnett and Majority Leader Fenberg and the governor's office um, all agree on is that we can do all of those things at the same time. And that is our goal. We want your input. We want to hear what you uh, think about what you've seen today, but we think we can do all of those things at the same time and we can actually finally get this thing across the finish line in a way that for years people haven't been able to do before. Final slide, I think. Unless I'm wrong. There it is. Yes. And we just want to thank Dr. Cog for being such a good partner along the way. Um, it's really been input from local communities and local elected leaders and folks like you and the business community and the environmental community that has helped shape this plan every single step along the way. We're at over 100 stakeholder meetings. Um, we hope to release the bill either next week or more likely the week after um, for people to review. And this wouldn't be a reality. We wouldn't have gotten this far without great partners like Dr. Cog and the local communities. And we're not gonna get it across the finish line without your support and help. And of course, we are continuing to shape this and work on this. And so this is an email um, or you can direct anything to directly to me or represent Gray as well on your thoughts, your questions, your concerns on ideas. Um, but we are here to listen to you. And with that, we'd love to open it up to questions. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Representative Gray and Senator uh, Winter. Um, let's open it up to discussion, and I want to ask you, in light of our agenda and our time constraints, I want to have a robust discussion, but let's try to keep our observations, our questions, and concerns uh, concisely presented. And remember that uh, the email that you were given here at the end is uh, available for individual input. I know our jurisdictions are probably all having internal discussions about this as well, and you can communicate them you know, at that level as well. So first Which I have up is... I, I just have a... Quick comment, Councilman. Mm -hmm. You were the very first press interview I ever did. And I was 24 years old and I was working on fast tracks. And you were asking me about why I cared about the fast tracks proposal. <laughs> and it was one of the scarier moments of my life because you were the first reporter I had ever talked to and it was on transportation funding. And so this seems very appropriate that you are now running this meeting. Okay. I have that scary effect on people apparently. I, I had people when I worked. I'm scared of reporters now, but you were my first one. <laughs> I worked. I worked at RTD with one of the consultant team, and when I met her afterwards, she said, "You know, we were scared as heck of you whenever you called." I apologize for that. Uh, Director Shaw, go ahead. Thank you. I just had a quick question on the fee schedule. Uh, otherwise, this was a complete and excellent presentation, um, and it may be that these are covered in the existing formulas, but 
Do we account for hybrids or do they fall under gas powered vehicles for the small amount that they use? Uh, do we contemplate future technologies like maybe hydrogen or things we haven't thought of yet? Uh, or, or would we pass further legislation if those become widely available and accepted? Sure, so the fees do count for plug-in electric hybrids. So either completely electric or plug-in electric. And within the bill, the definition we have includes all ZEV vehicles for those charges. So if there's hydrogen vehicles or other technologies that we haven't even contemplated yet, they are included in that fee schedule. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I see uh, Director Levy is now up. Go ahead. Yeah, thank you. Um, first, let me um, applaud your efforts here. I know it's, it's hard to uh, create a bill that um, is gonna please everybody or, or not displease everybody. And you've really done a good job of trying to strike the balance and I really applaud your efforts. Um, I am wondering about uh, the provision on the Multimodal and Mitigation Options Fund and that you've called out here um, with a total of $366 million over a 10 year period, you've called out um, helping advance front range rail there specifically. I'm wondering what you have in mind and given that um, it's a, although it's an ambitious bill, $366 million over 10 years <laughs> for all, all of these things. Um, yeah, it isn't going to go very far on a yearly basis. So how, how are you envisioning balancing a, you know, a great big um, project like that against all the other needs? I mean, for that project, we definitely don't have the money for front range rail in this bill. And we're not going to represent that we do. Um, but what we are trying to do is to create the groundwork for front range rail, which includes um, the, a preferred route that goes through the area that was set up for North Range Rail, for um, Northwest Rail as the preferred route for that. And we're confident that that's where we are right now. Um, if we get that money, that money is going to come from the federal government. Now, I'll tell you, and we can also send this to you guys, if you haven't seen it, is Amtrak has put up their proposed uh, map of where they think that rail should go if the Congress actually passes the next infrastructure bill. It's not the one that, it's not the stimulus bill that was passed before, it'd be the next bill. But they have posted a map of what they think it should be and it includes um, front range rail. And we've talked to the governor's office and we generally have agreement that if we do do that, um, the the path that generally follows um, where Front Range Rail was, was proposed to be would be the right way to go. So that would be great news for folks who want Front Range Rail. Now, we're not promising you that. We're not guaranteeing you that. But what we are looking at is putting the infrastructure in place and the money in place to get the studies and things that we need to do in order to be a really attractive candidate for federal money in place. Because that the cost is in the billions and for anyone who's involved in that knows we don't have those billions, but we're trying to make sure that we're as attractive and we're working with our federal delegation and they've been really great partners. We're working as hard as possible to be the best candidates we can be to, to get those federal dollars that could lead to front range rail in general and Northwest rail as being the route as possible. But we are, what we, what we can deliver is just the, the basis of the foundation. And then we need to make sure that the rest of the money comes in through. So would this be funding that could be used as a local match and how, I think my question was how would that need be balanced against all the other really fantastic uses of this money? And, and then you've got a, a state and local split. So I am just, you know, so wondering the how- multi, Yeah, the multimodal and mitigation option funds can be competitive and it absolutely is not meant to be eaten up by front range rail. Um, and we, 
we'll balance that. And I think the goal ultimately is by coming together with local communities. So I know that communities all along 36 have been saving up money, RTD's been saving up money. Um, and hopefully the state can help make the next big steps of Front Range Rail. So different studies, for example, that could happen. But we have no intention of having this entire fund go towards Front Range Rail because we know that there are so many multimodal needs all over the state, both in the Dr. Cog region and across the state. And in fact, Colorado has more multimodal transit in rural areas than any other state in the country and will continue to do so. Yeah, I mean, and the last big problem we need to get past is Tracy Craft Tharp, who's really been one of the hardest. I, I'm, oh, Tracy, well, I mean, what are you doing here? Never mind. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, is that all, uh, Director? I'll yes. move on to uh, Director Mulvey. Hi, yes, thank you. Uh, from Douglas County, um, asking whether or not, uh, representing Castle Pines, but in the region of Douglas <laughs> County, um, I wanted to ask about uh, one of the potential impacts of the increased fees, namely if, and I'm looking at them on my screen here, I might not have a full understanding, and I understand that, but I wonder if there might be an increased impact on the population that might have those fees passed down to them in the form of higher prices. And I certainly appreciate that there's no other way potentially to raise this money and it's spreading it out. But what occurs to some of my constituents so far is that the truck fee and the TNC fee in particular might both end up being passed down in terms of increased costs. And I know that some of my constituents would appreciate whether that could be addressed in some fashion or if that's a true impact or does it just kind of look like that, but it's not really like that. So thank you. Sure. Um, so we really built this around looking at equity and trying to be as equitable and as fair as possible. And so we started the premise of this bill that if everyone that's using the roads invests a little bit more then we can solve big problems. So we had that slide where other states around us uh, and across the country have just simply increased their gas tax uh, in order to pay for infrastructure. Now, what we came into this as, so we have the 10th lowest gas tax in the entire country, which means we're, we're not in line with what other consumers and other people are, play, are paying across the country. Um, but we also had equity in mind. So how we're using our roads. During the pandemic, I rarely left my house. I rarely filled up my gas tank. And I had numerous Amazon packages delivered to me with school supplies, cleaning supplies, groceries. I, when I didn't have time to make my kids lunch, I'd order Grubhub. And I depended on those roads to deliver me my services. So we're trying to match how people actually use those roads and how we pay for them. And so we're asking everyone to invest a little bit more. And that's going to have an impact on folks, but we also know that there's gonna be an impact when they have cleaner air, an impact when they have more multimodal choices on how to get to work in the doctors, uh, when they are spending less time in traffic, which means more time with their families. Um, so we're hoping that this small investment is well worth the return. And I'll just say, as a one follow up, she's very bad at filling up her gas tank. Um, she will like run it down to like three miles left before, and it terrifies me all the time. But so, just me, if you if you want to know like where we are on gas usage, that's that's where we are, and we could do better. <laughs> we could, it's true. I run my that, gas tank down to zero. That, that is true. I really appreciate it. And the detailed explanations of everything that you have going into the bill are really, really appreciated. So thank you for that additional information. Thank you. Thank you, Director. Uh, next up, I have uh, Director Peck. Thank you. Um, thank both of you for this presentation and especially the um, description of the Front Range Rail funding. I really appreciated that and how that's gonna work. But uh, Going back to revenue, uh, we're, we're a huge recreational state. Have you considered the historical syntax of putting maybe a dollar on ski tickets uh, for transportation 
or on the yep. Western Stock Show, um, for people who actually use our roads continually and yearly, um, have you dis have you thought about that or discussed it? Sure, and that's a really great question because we have been talking to people who have been, everybody who uses the roads and who uses our transportation system, we have not talked specifically to um, tourism providers and it's a really sensitive time to talk to them because we haven't had a stock show in the past couple of years and we've had real significant restrictions on ski in the past couple of years. And so I, the, you know, the ski companies, I don't think, I don't think I've had a meeting with, with stock show about this. I know that we have had meetings with ski companies their sensitivity right now is actually really high. So I'm not saying we should never do it um, because it is a big user of, for example, I-70. We've met with the I-70 co coalition many, many times, mm -hmm. um, but we haven't asked for an increase on fees or the imposition of a new fee on them right now because they're in-person providers that it's been a really, really hard time for them in the last 14 months and so we haven't asked for them yet but I, I agree with you it's not a conversation we can't ever have long term in the state it's just not part of the plan right now because um, of the effects that the pandemic has had on their line of business. And also the folks that are attending these events are going to be paying fees in a variety of different right. ways if you're taking an Uber or Lyft you'll pay that way if you are doing a rental car, if you're doing a car to car, a peer to peer car share to get to the ski resort, you're gonna be paying that way. And if you're putting gasoline in a car to go somewhere, um, you'll be paying that way. And so those things increase use on the road, but because we are doing our best to match the use of the road to who's paying, that when there's more use of a road for certain things like the stock show or ski resorts, there is gonna be an increase of funding into the infrastructure. Okay, that makes sense. Thank you. Thank you, Director. Uh, next up, I have Director Williams. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Senator and Representative for being here. Really appreciate it. Um, kind of talking about gas fees and things like that. Just curious, as you're going through the formation of this bill, was there any discussion around potentially replacing those kinds of taxes with the VMT tax or fee? Sorry, we'll say fee, uh, VMT fee. Uh, I, I, pretty sticky. That probably goes beyond what was it aggressively reasonable. Um, curious what, what those discussions were. Sure. I mean, I, I think long term, and I think we think long term that VMTs are probably where we're going to wind up as a state. I just don't think we're there, and we don't think the sponsors. I feel like I'm confident enough to say for all the sponsors, we're not there yet, and thinking the public is ready for a VMT because they have, we have to figure out how you report a VMT. Um, and there's just, we're not in a place right now where folks want to report the number of miles or where they're going to the government. I think we'll get there eventually. And one of the things we wanna do is work with the, uh, the companies who are tracking this information as much as possible um, to try to build up that infrastructure. Uh, but it's gonna be gradual, like even the, even the Ubers and the FedExes and the Amazons of the world don't want to turn over that information right now anyway, much less normal citizens. And so we're trying to create a, a foundation for that, but we're just not there yet. But absolutely, we agree that's where we would like to end up, but that's not what this bill is going to do. We're not going to be there yet. We just want to try to create the building blocks to get there eventually, because I do think that's the right answer. And I will add that um, as part of this uh, road show, we try to have people say road usage fee instead of VMT, sure. because um, right, how we're using the road takes into time in different ways, like deliveries, where vehicle miles travel is just vehicle miles. Um, but there's different uses that are also time-based. And so um, let's say road usage. Is that all, uh, Director? Thank that you. Is, thank you. Thank you. Uh, next up, I have Director Kelsey. Um, thank you both for your presentation. 
Um, and thank you for your sensitivity about <clears throat> um, the burden that the ski areas have um, taken this last, well, the last year, the last two seasons. Um, and also that, you know, that only folk, if, if you were to be considering a fee on ski tickets, um, it would only take in the winter recreational activities. And we've got a lot of traffic on the roads in the summertime that are headed into the, our mountains for summer re recreation. And they don't always have to buy a ticket for that stuff. So thank you very much. I appreciate your consideration. I hike every Sunday. <laughs> Good for you. For it, but I hike every Sunday. Yep. Yep. And so. sadly, with the climate moving the way it is right now, there's going to be, we unfortunately, are moving more towards uh, fewer ski days and more summer days. So we need to make sure that we balance that out. And I understand that. Yep. Thank you. Thank you, Saddle. I have uh, our director uh, Levy up again. Thank you. Go ahead. I think. Uh this is my second go round. Had, has everybody else had a chance to ask their question? Well, let me, um, let me get, there's uh, one in the, uh, in the Q and A, uh, Director Levy, if you don't mind, I'll ask that yeah, first. Yeah, no, I'm happy to defer. Uh, somebody from RAFTA, uh, Doug Blank, uh, Blankenship. So a uh, question is uh, uh, for uh, the Senator and the representative, will rural transit systems or regional transportation authorities access this funding primarily through CDOT and its uh, TPRs? Also, how will rural transit agencies apply for electric bus funding? Uh, that is through CDOT or through some other agency? I am actually gonna call a friend for help on that. I know that there is many people <laughs> from the administration on- Will, Tor, would you like to answer that question on behalf of the administration? I think you're still on. I did see Will here. Yeah, he even put a tie He's on. Wearing so a tie. Like, He's wearing a tie. He's wearing a tie. Let him answer. Does that mean so you're the serious? Question. Okay. Go ahead, Will. I, I'm sorry. Could you restate the question? Uh, yes. Hold on. I have to pull it back up. I think it, uh, Will, I think it's um, how do rural um, communities access the, um, the electrification um, um, dollars? Both electrification and multimodal option fund. Yes. Uh, so... The multimodal option fund would be the, the same way that the existing multimodal option fund is structured, where there would be an allocation formula based upon both population and transit ridership. It would use, be used to suballocate funds both to the MPOs and the TPRs, so that if you're within an MPO, then the MPO process would uh, do the allocation down to individual projects and there would be a process through the TPRs if you're outside of an MPO region. For the electrification enterprises, the, the intent is that there will be a competitive grant process that, that is run through um, each of the enterprises for doing those allocations. And that there would be, that would be available uh, across the entire state, both in rural Colorado and in the metropolitan area. Okay, thank you. Uh, Director Levy, go ahead. Yeah, thanks. I was looking um, at the enterprise structure that you've got in here and um, trying to figure out whether you're designating certain fees to fund each of those enterprises so that the fee would be the sole source of funding for that or, um, and I didn't see that. It looks like you're gonna draw from all, all of the revenue that's gonna be created and then a portion of it would go into the enterprise. I'm wondering, maybe I'm missing something, how you're gonna structure the enterprises so that they are true Tabor enterprises. Will, do you wanna do that or do you want me to do that? Um, go, go um, Will. Yeah, I'm happy to speak to it. I think that the intent is to specify that certain fees would go into the enterprises and that those would be justified based upon the impacts that those activities have. Uh, for instance, uh, when it comes to electrification, there, there are certain activities that have emissions impact that have quantifiable negative externalities on Coloradans 
the fees would be set at a, a level, you know, essentially no higher than those negative externalities. And that would then be going into the relevant enterprise. Uh, Director Levy, does that answer you? Well, I guess so, yeah. So um, you'd have to have a specific fee um, targeted to the enterprise so that there is that relationship so that it's a fee and not a tax. And, so and maybe I can ex explain yeah. that a little bit more if you don't mind, Director Levy. Yeah, um, so just, good. and I put some of the notes in the, in the chat as well for specificity. So to be clear, all the enterprises will be, or the three enterprises will be funded by either the TNC fee or the DNC fee. Those are the two fees that are supporting the enterprises. And the way right now for our purposes and for simplicity, we say things like the DNC, the delivery fee will be a total of 25 cents. But we'll what will happen in the actual bill draft language is that 25 cents will be broken down and the enterprise will be, um, each enterprise will be kind of um, um, imposing a much smaller fee and those ac across the board add up to 25 cents but each enterprise will be charging a smaller um, uh, fee. Does that make sense? Um, but it will be directly imposed by the enterprise um, on the consumer in this case. And again, the only two fees that are supporting the enterprises are TNC and DNC. Okay, that's helpful. I didn't see that, that's helpful. Okay, thank you. Um, I, there was one follow-up from Dan. Uh, and one more question, is there any way the amount of funding allocated to the MPOs, TPRs could be estimated prior to passage of the bill? Yeah, I think the place to find that currently, and Will, you can correct me if I'm wrong, but just for clarity purposes, the way that we're intending the MMOF to work moving forward is the exact same way that it's been built out to date. So those allocations, if you go to the um, website and as soon as I'm done talking, I will go look up the link and drop it into the chat. You can actually access a lot of this information about how to access these funds directly. And we're not changing any of those allocation models. Um, and they are um, my understanding on the website, but I will double check that and try to get the link on the chat um, immediately. Okay, well, thank you very much. I um, have a, a question next up from Director Stolzman. Thank you, just clarifying on what Sarah just said. So could you just clarify where the Front Range Rail funding will be funded from if the MMOF is being used as it's always been used? So um, I, again, I, I, I'll, I'll defer to the sponsors, but I think the intent right now that we've talked about is that MMOF is a competitive process. People can apply for those funds and that one can imagine where, um, I, I don't think anyone was planning for the, as, as uh, Representative Gray said, we weren't planning to fund all of the Front Range Rail, but perhaps initial studies and some initial work, um, those some of those MMF dollars um, could be used for that purpose. And they would have to apply um, through the MMOF process, but that it would be um, within those funds and a much, much smaller amount. I mean, these are um, some dollars used to um, support studies around alignment and routes. I, I, okay, I appreciate the response. I think it, it would be nice to set aside funding as is indicated by the slides. I mean, we've been told in a number of presentations there would be some funding for getting things started. We could use other match local funding and things like that. So to specifically call a project out and then to say, well, it's gonna compete with every other project and we're not actually gonna do it. It just seems like, well, then why even put it on the slide? Yeah, so I think we are having those conversations about the specificity of what we need for Front Range Rail right now, especially at this moment in time, given all the stimulus funding. Um, and so I think we're at a moment in time where, you know, we very well could, as we move forward with this bill, specify a specific amount and also work with RTD on the amount of money that they have um, and also work with all the local communities and put something together and a collaboration together that makes us very attractive for the federal stimulus money that we know is coming. And we've been talking to our federal delegation about that. And I want to work with you all as local leaders, along with our federal delegation and our TD and state, because I think we are at this unique moment in time to bring together money from each of those entities to make Front Range Rail a reality. And um, I know I was supposed to call you over the weekend. Um, 
Ashley, and it was Easter, but we should actually have this conversation and figure out next steps. Perfect. Thank you. Um, I, I know we really appreciate the time you're spending with us here, and we've actually spent more time than we had allotted on the agenda. So I might do some rearranging and postpone one of the agenda items just to be able to wrap this up, uh, if, it's, if that's okay. Uh, I, have a, I have a question. Is there some other policy objective to the two-year suspension of the faster road safety fee uh, that we're after, other than what you quoted the governor saying to provide some relief to uh, people because of COVID. It seems to me if I go to a restaurant and they used to charge for the salad with my meal, and then they say, well, now the salad comes with a meal, but we're increasing the drinks, the cost of the drinks, that it's a wash. So th it occurs to me there's there's some other objective from suspending that fee for two years other than you know, making it up some other way. Would you, do you want to answer that sponsors or would you like me to? Yeah. Okay, you were pointing, so I thought that's what you were doing. Okay, so I think when you think about those in, um, in connection to, um, you know, the sponsors also recognize the, um, and the governor, um, the, the demands of this post-pandemic um, economy. And so there's a delay in the start of the fees to also allow for some room for recovery. And um, yes, we do a, a small um, uh, amount of consumer relief. Um, I hear your point, but I think the immediacy of that over two years um, a lot still allows us to create what the ultimate goal, which is a long-term sustainable funding source for kind of future proofing this transportation package. So I get, I get your concern, it's a fair concern, but I think um, the governor um, felt very strongly about providing some consumer relief and savings to consumers. I think overall, he'd also argue, and I think the deck points this out as well, that right now consumers are paying, you know, as annually up to $700 um, uh, a year on wear and tear in their vehicles. And the intent is, and that's from the new trip report um, that they issue every year, um, that they're overall, there are cost savings to consumers. Okay. But you make a fair uh, point. I, I I understand. Okay, thank you. I'm just trying to understand if there was a little more uh, strategic thinking to it, other than the obvious uh, uh, that was there. Now, one other question: Is there any funding specifically in this uh, proposal focused on expansion of BRT, bus rapid transit? So I don't think I don't see Herman on. If Herman, if you are and you can jump in, we don't call for it specifically, but there are in the ten-year plan. Um, in in other conversations I've had with C CDOT members and staff, they are talking about um, um, increasing some of the outrider program. And so there's a lot of I know there's some new routes. I think I want to say going into Alamosa and some other rural parts of of the state and um, in other locations around the state. Um, in terms of increasing BRT, I'd have to double check that, um, Chairman, and just get back to you specifically on BRT. But it is, um, uh, historically, CDOT has used some of their share of the MOF, MMOF funds to fund BRT. Okay, thank you. Uh, I don't see any other questions from directors. I would like to ask Melinda or Doug, uh, do, when we log off this Zoom meeting, I know we're recording it, but can we capture the chat? and all of the remarks and the questions that are in the chat so that that can be preserved as well. Uh, thank you. Uh, I know we can just copy and paste it. Uh, well, I wanna thank uh, Representative Gray and uh, Senator Winter and Will and Sarah for being here to take these questions. And you can always uh, email them at the address that is in the chat, uh, the email address, it's, I think it's a Gmail address. Uh, Melinda, did you have something on this? Uh, no, I'm sorry. Okay, I apologize for my chiming clock. It, I seem to be on screen, whatever the top of the hour is. Uh, thank you, uh, everybody. And uh, I think on what I want to do now uh, as chair is move uh, to agenda item six uh, and finish out the meeting with that. And I want to apologize to Brad Calvert uh, for item two. We will move that maybe to the next board meeting or work session. I kind of feel like Jimmy Kimmel at the end of each show apologizing to Matt Damon that we have to push him to another show. But uh, in the interest of time, I want to move on to the last agenda item and Ron. Matt, Matt, Matt Damon's actually right over here. I don't know if you want to talk to him. <laughs> him. You, have to, you have to have watched, uh, you have to watch Jimmy Kimmel to understand that. So uh, yeah. Ron, uh, can you take uh, uh, item thank six? You all. Anyway, we're probably going to log off, but thank you all. Thank you. Thanks, Matt. Thanks, Faith. Please follow up with us if you have any questions. Thank you.
Our Thank discussion you. of uh, CDOT Senate Bill 17267, year three project options. And Ron is going to uh, lead us off on that. Go ahead, Ron. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, good afternoon, uh, directors. Ron Papsdorf, Director of Transportation Planning and Operations here at Dr. Cog. Um, wanted to get this item in front of you kind of informally, but at least give an opportunity uh, for you to have some awareness of these discussions that are going on and um, have an opportunity to provide any feedback uh, that you might have. So the, the information was uh, included in attachment D of your packet. Um, so just by way of refresher, um, Senate Bill 17, 2067 authorized four years of lease purchase agreements on state facilities to raise uh, $2 billion in um, funding for the state uh, in equal amounts over the, over the four years, so $500 million a year, uh, beginning in fiscal year 1819. Um, under the provision of that bill, CDOT receives $1.8 billion of the proceeds over those four years. Uh, with the remainder dedicated to maintenance and capital projects on state buildings. Um, at least 10% of the CDOT funding uh, was required to be um, uh, spent on transit projects. In um, 2019, the Transportation Commission approved a um, list of $1.6 billion of highway projects um, and um, has also identified lists for um, transit investments as well. Due to COVID, the, the Transportation Commission has made some adjustments to their lists, um, but the state treasurer, in, in a nutshell, the state treasurer is preparing to issue the third year of these lease purchase agreements. Um, again, assuming it will raise approximately $500 million um, for the year three investments. So CDOT is going through a process now of identifying which projects from its 10-year list to invest these um, third year of resources on. Um, I do I will share my screen. I wanna hit a couple of slides from the presentation that CDOT provided at the last uh, statewide transportation advisory committee. Bear with me, I'm still getting a little bit used to Zoom, but I think I can, let's see. Uh, Director Flynn, can you see that? Um, slide that says Senate bill year yes. three project options region one. Yes, I can certainly see it and I think everyone else can in the meeting. Thank you. Perfect. Thank you. Um, so uh, what they've what CDOT is has done and um, you you may or may not recall that um, after the passage of Senate bill 267 there was a long process uh, the CDOT worked with a lot of stakeholders to come up with sort of some equity um, formulas on how the money would be distributed from Senate Bill 267 to the five CDOT regions around the state over the four years of Senate Bill 267. Um, so um, CDOT is, is keeping, an eye, keeping an eye on those equity formulas to make sure that each region um, over the four years of revenue uh, will receive sort of that equity target for the investments in each of the regions. Um, they're, they're, Staying pretty close, I think there were some front-loaded expenditures on a, on a big project on North I-25 in Region 4 that sort of tilted a bit there. Um, so sort of Region 4 in year three and four will receive less of the resources to make sure to balance that out. And uh, so the other regions get uh, to that equity uh, target. Um, so what CDOT presented um, at Stack was this list of proposed projects. And the reason we're bringing it to you this evening is so that you're aware um, and to make sure that you have a chance. If you have any thoughts or comments to weigh in, CDOT is, um, I think, still intending to bring this forward to the Transportation Commission for action at their April meeting. Uh, so in two weeks, and this will be presented to Stack again um, this Friday, I think they're going to be seeking a recommendation. So we wanted some direction, just make sure you were aware. I don't think there's any big surprises here. Um, these projects are, are coming from the CDOT 10 year uh, pipeline of projects um, that's, that was identified with input from a lot of different folks, uh, including all of you and Dr. Cog. Um, the focus for region one uh, for these funds includes um, funding for a first investment in the uh, Floyd Hill project um, in the Denver region. Um, the uh, another um, large uh, bridge rehab and replacement project on I-70 West, this one at Ward Road. There are a number of uh, very problem bridges um, on that stretch of I-70. Um, 
using some of the transit funding, um, uh, working towards the uh, mobility hub proposed at Idaho Springs to serve Bustang um, and link to um, uh, uh, transit, local transit service in that area. Uh, the a Lone Tree Mobility Hub, similarly situated, um, a, a down, down payment on some preliminary work for the I-25 and State Highway 7 uh, Mobility Hub, and uh, likewise a down payment through some pre-construction activities at the Castle Rock Mobility Hub. Um, on, on this page then also uh, highway capital money going to a portion of the funding for the I-270 I project from I-76 to I-70. And I'll note that CDOT I think is pursuing some federal discretionary grant funds to also help go towards that project, that project's in environmental work now. Um, also on the region one list are uh, $3 million proposed to go to some additional bus tank fleet purchases um, allocated to the Denver region. Um, a maintenance facility to help service um, Bustang. And then because Region 1 has a, doesn't have a lot of sort of projects on the shelf ready to go, um, and in anticipation of this round of 267 funding, uh, the fourth year of 267 funding, potential additional federal money, uh, they're proposing to allocate $19 million on some pre-construction activity for projects off of the uh, year five through 10 list of that of the 10 year pipeline of projects. I think the this is probably the biggest opportunity for some some influence. I think the the point I would um, uh, make is that once you make choices to invest in pre construction activities for a project, you're you're you know moving that project up the list of priorities, and um, those likely become the priorities for when real construction money becomes available to move those forward, which means that other projects on that list, um, you know, aren't as ready to take advantage of new money. So I, um, they are talking about a number of different projects. Um, uh, Kings Valley uh, project, uh, that's US, that's US 85, uh, US 285 in the southwest part of the of region one. Um, Again, more of those I-70 um, West uh, bridges in the metro area, um, the I-270 State Highway 7 um, uh, interchange area project, um, US-85 uh, uh, in the area of uh, Mead, and then um, some I-70 escape ramps and some other projects on the mountain corridor of I-70 in the west part of the region, um, just as a potential list. So I do want to drop down to the list from the 10-year list of projects that was inclu also included in your packet. So these, this is the region one list from the 10-year pipeline of projects. These are the year five through 10 projects. I know, hope you can see that. Let me see if I can zoom in just a hair. Thank you. That's helpful to Thank zoom you. in a little bit. <laughs> okay. I think I've got the entirety of that list. So again, these were projects that were anticipated uh, for years five through 10. Um, and um, all, you know, obviously all really important projects and all of, uh, but um, there are some projects, uh, just wanted you to make sure that you reviewed that list. And I would suggest in the interest of time, you know, if, would, if you look at that list, if there are uh, priorities that are important to you that we can share with CDOT um, uh, from the Dr. Cog perspective, um, you know, there are some, uh, there's the US 6 and Wadworth Boulevard interchange that um, they're not proposing to do um, uh, pre-construction activity on. Um, so sort of think about the projects here that uh, may also be important in the region that we might want to encourage uh, CDOT to look to uh, investing some pre-construction dollars on to get them ready to take advantage of um, new funding um, through either year four of Senate Bill 267, new state funding through a state package if that, if that moves forward, or uh, new federal money, additional federal money. Uh, through a stimulus package or uh, federal appropriations or a new reauthorization bill. With that brief overview, I'd be happy to um, entertain any questions um, that the board might have. Okay, let me uh, invite the directors to raise your hands. 
uh, to ask Ron questions. I don't see a I don't see a rush here. Stunning. Perhaps perhaps everybody's just taking this list in. <laughs> All right. I, I know it's a, I know it's a lot of information. As yeah. I said, um, this will come back to stack on Friday this week. We have uh, about two weeks until the um, transportation commission meeting. So if you think of things, feel free to email um, me and um, uh, uh, board I'm chair Stolzman, who is your uh, member representative on stack, and I can convey those to um, CDOT. <laughs> Okay, and, and as you said that, uh, Director Stolzman has raised her hand. Uh, Ashley, go ahead. Thank you, yeah, I was just gonna say pretty much the same thing. If anyone thinks of anything um, on the region one list or the region four list, cause we're, we're in both. But like Ron said, the region four list is smaller cause they got, there were some projects that were funded ahead. Um, so that's why we're focusing on the region one section here today. And then just the one other thing I'll add is that noise wall maintenance item got pulled ahead, CDOT funded that with some other funding, so. Um, we'll keep it. Ron, Ron has just done an amazing job um, calculating all this for us, watching it all for us, making, you know, making us aware of where we are in the process and ensuring that we get our fair share. So thanks, Ron, for all the hard work on that. And um, if anybody does think of anything, please just let us know. Thank you. Great. Thank you. Any other directors, questions, observations or comments, please? This is, you know, this is a little different and difficult meeting virtually because we can't look around the room and, and uh, see anybody raising their hands. So, uh, all right. I don't see any other directors with questions, Ron. Looks like you're off the hook. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair and directors. Appreciate the time. All right. I, uh, again, I just want to say to Brad, thank you for agreeing to defer your presentation because with the time remaining, we don't have enough uh, time to devote to it. And so we will schedule that, Doug, correct? We'll schedule that for another um, session, either the either the board meeting or, or a work session. Thank correct. you. All right. I will point out as compensation that, Brad, uh, you were compared to Matt Damon. So <laughs> Jason Bourne. <laughs> okay. Uh, thank you, Director Brockett. Uh, I don't see any other business before the board. Do any directors have any business to raise before I give you 15 minutes of your day back? Uh, but we'll eat that up later when Brad does give his presentation. Anyone else? Thank you. I don't see any hands. Uh, that being uh, the case, I think we can adjourn now. Uh, Doug, nothing else? Excellent. Perfect. It sounds like a, I, I don't want to take a motion to adjourn because I don't, I don't want to take a risk that a motion to adjourn would be defeated. <laughs> so uh, uh, with that, uh, everybody enjoy the rest of your evening and have a great rest of your week. Thank you. Thank we you, Kevin. Thanks, we everybody. Great job, Kevin. Thank you, Kevin. Great job.